The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. It's a privilege to open God's Word with you this morning, and if you would do that, open to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. In this series that we've been going through, the I Am statements of John, the statements of Jesus in John, were faced with the most important question in the world. And this question forms a crossroads for each one of us. It's a crossroads that has eternal implications for every soul. That question, of course, is, who am I? That's what Jesus asks us. And specifically, he asks each of us, who am I to you? Not because every one of us has an opinion that's correct, but because each one of us has to deal with that question, who is Jesus? Each one of us has to deal with that question. So in this series, we are learning more, who is Jesus? As Nick spoke in the introduction to the series, John's purpose in preaching or in writing the Gospel of John was to show and demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ. He says in John 20, 31, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John's purpose was that we would believe who Jesus is and get to, and get to understand who Jesus is. And he records these statements that Jesus makes that have a certain rhythm to them and a certain formula, if you will. And we call them the I am statements because the Greek ego am I is with each of these statements. Each one of these that we're exploring is like a facet on a diamond. And as you turn that diamond in the light, the light catches a different facet and we see a different aspect of the beauty of that diamond. And so each of these statements is intended to show and reflect and see a yet another beauty and facet of who Christ is. Most of them involve a metaphor. And so Nick introduced the, um, the series with, I am the bread of life. David Chandler followed with, I am the door. Brian last week spoke with the metaphor, I am the light of the world. And we're gonna to get to, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. Today, we're gonna to consider a very clear statement that Jesus made without a metaphor. This one is unique in the I am statements because it doesn't have a metaphor. And he said it very clearly, and very forcefully, I am Almighty God. This is the most profound and audacious claim that Jesus made. And it received a forceful response from his audience. And it demands a response today. And all these messages in the series of I, the I am statements demands a response from us. We can respond with intellectual assent. Oh yes, I acknowledge Jesus's claims. We could respond with a historical agreement. Yes, he was a real man who lived on the earth. We can respond with emotion. Yes, Jesus is my friend. We can respond sentimentally. He was a good teacher and I try to follow his teachings. We can be nearly right but deadly wrong. We can be actively religious and be wrong. Matthew 7, 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say, Lord, didn't we cast out demons and perform miracles in your name? And I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. We can be a Bible scholar and miss it. John 5, 39 and 40 says, this is Jesus speaking, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. We can be the greatest Bible scholar, pastor, teacher and miss it. Or we can respond with faith and surrender, obedience, love. 
uh, to who Jesus is. So my question to you is, what is your response to, to this question this morning? What is my response? Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, you are so good to even give us this question to consider. Who is Jesus? There's so much confusion and controversy and bitter fighting and rage and many incorrect answers. Would you today reveal, perhaps for the first time, who Jesus is? And may our response be one of faith, one of surrender, obedience, love, repentance, looking to him as the only way to life with you. Would you speak now in ways that I cannot? In Jesus' name, amen. So our context in John 8 follows last week's sermon from Brian, where uh, the Feast of Booths has happened and Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's addressing the people, and he just spoke these words, I am the light of the world. In John 8, 12, and John 8, 13, the Pharisees respond to him and say, um, well, let's just read it. So the Pharisee said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true or valid or admissible on your behalf. So they challenge him in verse 13, and what goes from there is uh, a back and forth discussion with elevating contention on the part of the Jews. They bring confusion and anger, and it comes to hostility and rage and even murderous intent by the Jews, interspersed with, with truth and gracious response, invitation, and even warnings from Jesus. And so as we work through the chapter, I just want to outline some of the contrasts that John lays out for us in this chapter he speaks of Jesus' testimony either being true or false. The Jews being of this world and versus Jesus being not of this world. He speaks of a warning from Jesus of dying in their sins versus those who come to him uh, never seeing death. He speaks in the contrast of Jesus' earthly and heavenly fathers versus the Jews' ancestral and spiritual father. He speaks about freedom versus slavery. He speaks about continuing Jesus' word as proof of true faith versus not hearing Jesus' word as proof of rejection of salvation. And so all these contrasts, if you read through the, uh, John chapter 8, all these contrasts, and in these, Jesus exposes and dismantles the um, false securities that the Jews were relying on hey, we're Abraham's children. Well, if you were Abraham's children, here's how you would act. And so because of the way you're acting, you're proving that you're not Abraham's children and so forth. It's actually love and mercy for him to do this. To dismantle the false securities of, of false hope is not um, a lack of love. It's actually the demonstration of love to do that. And he is showing that to them. So he uses this phrase, I am, several times in the chapter before we get to the focus of our of our uh, time together. Look in verse 24, Matthew, or John 8, 24. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If you have the NAS version, perhaps other versions, you'll see that the word he is in italics. That means it was not there in the Greek, the original but it's been supplied for the understanding uh, in the English. So he's actually saying, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And that prompts the question, verse 25, who are you? Um, they were perhaps confused. What are you saying? Then in verse 28, Jesus said, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Again, uh, he says, then you will know that I am, the he is in italics, it means it was supplied for our understanding, but it wasn't there in the Greek. Ego am I is there in verses 24 and 28. 
when he says that when you lift up the Son of Man, he's speaking about his crucifixion. Crucifixion was not a Jewish form of punishment, it was a Roman form of punishment. And so they may not have understood how is that gonna happen? But he said, when that happens, and I'm foretelling that it is gonna happen, then you'll know that I am. And for many people, for specifically the audience he was talking to, um, they would even after that reject him. But there were a group, there was a group in Acts chapter two, after when Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he says to them, Acts 2, 36 and 37, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, whom you lifted up. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Those people listening to Peter understood, we blew it. We missed the Messiah. We killed our only hope. The people who Jesus is speaking to here, many of them, sadly, uh, continue to reject him. Maybe some of them were part of that group in Acts 2. But Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, then you will know that I am. And uh, the good news is in Acts 2, Peter followed up, said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and so there is hope. There was hope for those who recognized that they blew it. They missed their Messiah. Verse 24, when Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you'll die in your sins, he was calling for belief. And in verse 30, uh, John records that a number, many, believed in him. However, he then goes on to record from verse 31 onward that their faith actually was just superficial faith. It wasn't saving faith and demonstrated in several ways. Number one, that they did not accept or continue in Jesus's word and they had no place for his word. Number two, their focus was on an internal sense of freedom versus freedom from sin, true freedom. Third, their reliance on Abraham first as their father and then on God as their father. But they were exposed as not following Abraham's spiritual example of faith and obedience and not loving the one whom God sent. And then they also demonstrated their faith was not saving faith by their active desire to fulfill the desires of their true father, the devil, who was a murderer and a liar. So, the, so all that is kind of background and context and the hostility is building and the rage is building. And we finally get to our um, more close context starting in verse 48 to 59. Let's look at verses 48 through 59. Verse 48 records for us the blasphemous accusation. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? He had just said that their father is the devil and devil, the word devil means slanderer or accuser. And what do they do? They prove that they are children of the devil by slandering him, calling him a Samaritan, a half-breed, a despised half-breed and demon-possessed. They can't refute his words, so they attack him with an ad hominem attack on, who, on his person. Verses 49 through 51 record Jesus' gracious response, as well as a warning and an invitation. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone, including those who are listening to me, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Jesus provides a gracious answer. He overlooks the, very, the first accusation of being a, a Samaritan, of the ones who the Jews despised. And, and but it does respond to the accusation of having a demon. He says, I'm not demon possessed. There is one who seeks my glory and he also judges. There's a warning there. He will judge. Then he also gives the invitation. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, again, anyone who, I'm, who is listening to me, any of you, my fellow Jews, keeps my word, he will never see death. Verses 52 and 53 reply, or, um, record their appeal to their great hero, Abraham. Verse 52, the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon 
Abraham died, and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Their question here is similar to the question of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? They're asking Jesus, are you greater than Abraham? How can that be? He died, and how are you saying that anyone who keeps your word will never see death? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who are you? They're asking the right question with the wrong motive and understanding and heart, but it is the right question. Verses 54 through 56 as another gracious response and a stunning statement about their father Abraham. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Jesus says that Abraham was overjoyed or thrilled with the anticipation of seeing Jesus' day. And he did see it. He, he had the anticipation and the fulfillment of seeing Jesus' day. He saw it and was glad. How, would that, how did that happen? How did Abraham see Jesus' day? We're not told specifically uh, of a certain instance or situation in Abraham's life, but in Hebrews 11, uh, verse 13 the writer records this. All these, the patriarchs, died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. So Abraham somehow had insight uh, based on God's covenant with him, the Abrahamic covenant, that through him, through his offspring, God would bless the world. And so he knew it was gonna start with Isaac. And he wasn't sure exactly how it was gonna, everything was gonna be accomplished, but somehow he had faith and insight that it was gonna be done by God. Verse 57, the Jews protest about this statement about seeing, Abraham seeing Jesus' day. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? If it was a south side, uh, in our south side context, it would be, you're, you don't even qualify for the Nike fellowship, and you've seen Jesus, you've seen Abraham? The, the age of 50 was a full manhood. It was also the time when a Levite retired from active duty. And so they're not, they're not defining how old Jesus was. We knew he was around 30, 33 or so. Uh, but they're saying, you're still a young guy. And you claim to have seen Abraham. Now, Jesus didn't claim to have seen Abraham. He said Abraham saw his day. But they're still under the mindset that Abraham's greater than this guy, this Jesus, and so they say, you, the less, have seen our great father Abraham? Well, no, actually Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. So we get to the culminating response in verse 58. And the focus of our attention this morning, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, was born, I am. He says, he, he starts his response with truly, truly, amen, amen, in the Greek, which, which means this is a fact, whether you believe it or not, this is a fact, what I'm gonna say next. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born or came into existence, I am. We'll explain some more of that in just a little bit, but look at verse 59, their violent reaction in his escape. Verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself, or was hid, and went out of the temple. So going back to verse 58, the I am statement. Before Abraham was born, I am. It seems like to us, that's bad grammar. Shouldn't he have said more properly, before Abraham was born, I was? Because that makes sense. Before Abraham came into existence, I was already there. Seems logical. But he says, before Abraham was born, I am. And even though it doesn't necessarily make sense to us, it made perfect sense 
to the Jews. And that's why they immediately picked up stones to stone him. They knew what he was saying. They knew that he was saying, before Abraham even came into existence, I am eternally present. As in uh, Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before the mountains became in, came into existence, you are God. Before Abraham came into existence, I am. The ever-living um, one has always existed. Jesus is saying there was a time that Abraham didn't exist, and then he did exist. I've always existed. And so he's saying, yes, I am greater than Abraham. I am God himself. If you flip over a few pages to John 10, John 10, 30 through 34, Jesus is in another discourse with the Jews. We'll pick up partway through. He says, I and the Father are one. And again, the violent reaction, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. They knew immediately what he was saying and the implications of what he was saying, even though it doesn't uh, become a, that apparent to us, perhaps, on the first reading. He was boldly and forcefully not timidly, he was forcefully claiming for himself the sacred name of God. He was boldly and forcefully claiming God's name for himself. Let's go back to Exodus 3 that Robin read this morning. When God is speaking to Moses, he identifies himself as I am. The name of God in the Old Testament, the sacred name of God, he had a number of names by which he was known. But this one that was um, formed by the letters Y-H-W-H was so sacred that the Jews would not pronounce it. It was derived from the, a word that means to be. And it's written as Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. As, that's Lord, in our Bibles. And so whenever you see Lord in all capitals, that's this name, Yahweh. The sacred name of God. It first occurs in Genesis 2, verse 4, and it occurs over 6,800 times in the Old Testament, this name of God. And eventually the Jews added the vowels from Adonai to the four letters of the name of God. And that's where we get the the uh, how to pronounce Yahweh, and it eventually became Jehovah. And so if you see Lord in all caps, or Y-H-W-H, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, all four of those um, options are this name of God. So God is saying to Moses, tell them I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. And what does I am mean? It's the eternal present tense. God is in the eternal present. He has never not been. He has eternally been in the present tense. He sees all time. We are slaves and, and creatures of time. We are bound by time. He's outside of time. He has never, there's not been a time that God has not existed. And so he's saying by this name, I am, I am the eternal present. There's two other aspects I'd like just to point out in this, this uh, section of scripture in Exodus 3. Two other aspects of, of the I am. Look in 3, verse 11 and 12. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. The other aspect, one of the aspects of the I am in this section is his presence with us to help. 
his presence. God says, I will be with you. Not only am I the eternal, ever existing one, I am with you. Then look in verse 17. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and so forth, all those ites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. The other aspect of the I am in this, in this section is his deliverance. So he's revealing himself to Moses as the eternal God who is with you to save you, to deliver you. He's saying to, the, to Moses, I'm the ever living one, I don't change. I'm the ever present one, I'm with you. I am the ever saving one, I will deliver you. I live, I draw near for the purpose of saving you. That's wrapped up in the name I am. Flip over two chapters to Exodus 6. Verse 2. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And there you'll see an example of Lord being in all caps. I am, I am. And I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, as El Shaddai. But by my name, Lord, I am, I did not make myself known to them. Now the word Lord or I am is in Genesis in the early, um, the, most, the first book of the Bible, a number of times. And so God did reveal himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was known to them, but not in the full aspect of who he is in the, in the way of deliverance. He wasn't delivering Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was bringing them into the land. He was not delivering them per se from bondage as he was going to do with the with Moses and the people of Israel. And so he can say here, yes, I've showed myself as almighty God, El Shaddai, but did not reveal myself as the one who's all present to help and to deliver the deliverance. That's a new aspect of, of who God is that he was revealing to Moses. So going back to the New Testament, Jesus is taking that, importing all that meaning and truth onto himself. He's saying, I am the ever-living one. As we can see in Revelation 1.17, John, the apostle John is recording, um, when I saw him, Jesus, in a vision, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. I am the ever-living one. Jesus is also saying, I'm the ever-present one. When he commissioned his disciples in Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He is the ever-living one. He's the ever-present one. He's the ever-saving one. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter tells us this, for, G for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Jesus is the ever living one, the ever present one, the ever saving one. He's importing that and bringing that onto himself. He's claiming that and is true. Jesus had to be fully human to accomplish salvation. It was necessary for him to be a man, to be our representative and to bear our sins in his body on the cross to be our perfect substitutionary sacrifice. But he also had to be fully God. He had to be full God because our sin is infinite offense against an infinite God. And only God could pay an infinite penalty for sin, for sin that calls for infinite penalty. Salvation is of the Lord. And it begins and ends with, with God as the primary or causative actor, the decisive actor in salvation. So Christ had to be God in order for that to be the case. Only someone who is truly God could mediate between God and man, revealing God to man and bringing man back to God. Only someone who is truly God could do that. And so Jesus had to be 
God. As God, he has the right to judge sin and he will judge sin. As God, he bore the judgment for our sin so that we could be forgiven and have no condemnation either in this life or in eternity. And he does have the power to keep us secure as God. The greatest revelation of God to us is in his son. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 and 19 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the church, the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in him. John records in John 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him, he has revealed him to us. Jesus is God. And that's what he's claiming in our passage today. Before Abraham was born, I am. And again, it, it, it resulted in a violent, immediate, rage-filled, murderous response. Because that was blasphemy to the Jews. And they knew from Leviticus 24, anyone who blasphemed the Lord must die by stoning. And being in the temple, perhaps um, apparently still under construction, there were stones available. And so they picked them up. Uh, we're going to throw him at him. And he hid himself and was, uh, was uh, not harmed. Why? Because his time had not yet come. He was the one who was going to decide and lay down his life um, in, in submission to his father. He was not going to allow them to dictate the timing. So we, we today have two choices to respond to this statement from Christ. I am eternal God. We can accept or submit to that or reject it. And every one of us in, in this setting, everyone in the world will one day face that question, who is Jesus? And eternity rides on that answer. Will I um, submit to him in worship because of who he is, eternal God, the one who's ever present, ever saving, or do I reject that and bear therefore the punishment, the, the due punishment, just punishment for my sins? In John 8, there are several marks or characteristics of someone who responds to the question, who is Jesus with he is my Lord and my God? Let me just run through those. I have 10 marks or characteristics. These aren't, these aren't the basis of salvation. These are the results of someone who truly submits to the Lordship and the God, um, Jesus as God. Number one, surrender. Verse 12 says, he who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the one mark or characteristic of someone who is following Jesus is surrender. They're following him. Verse 15 gives us eternal perspective. Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. Those who are rejecting him are, are flesh bound and earth bound. But those who submit to Christ have an eternal perspective. They're not judging according to the flesh. The mark of faith, verse 24, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. Therefore, he also means those who do believe in him, who demonstrate faith, uh, are not gonna die in their sins. Obedience, the mark of obedience, verse 31. 
So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. The mark of obedience demonstrates surrender to Christ. The mark of knowledge, verse 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's the next one, freedom from sin. They had misunderstood him to be talking about um, national freedom. And they said, we're not slaves of anyone. Although inconveniently they were under the thumb of the Romans and they were conveniently ignoring that. Um, But he was talking about freedom from sin. That's another mark of one who is surrendered to Christ. Verse 39 If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. The marks of faith and obedience, those were the deeds of Abraham. He demonstrated faith and obedience in the Old Testament. And so Jesus is saying, if you are his children, which actually you're not, but if you were, do the deeds of Abraham. Verse 42, the mark of worship. If God were your father, and he's not, but if he were, you would love me. And so the the mark of one who is, Surrender to Christ is worship. Verses 43 and 47, spiritual attentiveness. Why do you not understand what I am saying? Is because you cannot hear my word. And then verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. But one who is in surrender to Christ is spiritually attentive. And finally, verse 51, the mark of fearlessness. If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. When we don't fear death, we don't fear anything. The mark of one who is in surrender to Christ, the marks include surrender, eternal perspective, faith, obedience, knowledge, freedom from sin, faith and obedience again, worship, spiritual attentiveness, and fearlessness. On the other hand, marks of one who responds to the question, who is Jesus and the claim of Jesus that I am eternally God, the one who rejects this, their marks are defiance instead of surrender, a temporal focus instead of eternal perspective, unbelief instead of faith, rebellion instead of obedience, willful ignorance instead of knowledge, slavery to sin instead of freedom, from sin, disobedience instead of faith and obedience, rejection instead of worship, spiritual hardness instead of spiritual attentiveness, and a fear of death instead of fearlessness. Jesus, who is God, is asking each of us today, who do you say that I am? And we have to answer. If you don't, not aware or sure of your answer, I welcome you, even beg you, to find someone after the service to to talk about it, be open, and find out who is this Jesus and what is my um, response to him as God. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are God, and we acknowledge that and worship you for that. Because as God, you alone have the ability and the power and accomplished salvation for your people. And you are are good to cause us and force us to look at this question, who is Jesus, um, and answer it with honesty. Pray today for every heart here that we would look at it with honesty and ask, have I surrendered to the one who has a claim on my life because he is God? Am I living in obedience, submission, love, worship, fearlessness? Or am I on my own path and doing my own desires? Fearing death, ever trying to avoid it. Would you expose hearts today, Lord God? Thank you, you've given us answers and hope in the gospel. May we be people of hope and fearlessness in Christ's name, amen. 
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.